Yes, sir. Glad to be here. I hope you all are. Talk to you tonight about some things I think that are very foundational. These are foundational truths and uh, kind of things that uh, really aren't negotiable. Uh, we, had to, we had some people come through the church the other day and they gave away some of these uh, CDs with their music. And uh, on the back of it, it has a uh, statement of faith, sort of. And I want to read it for you tonight. Here's what it says. It says, you will die physically one day like everyone else. After you die, Almighty God will judge you. If you are like most, you will end up in the lake of fire, and you will be there forever. There is only one way to escape the lake of fire and enter heaven. You must be biblically, biblically saved, which means you must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way to receive forgiveness for sins. After that, you must remain faithful to God to escape being hurt by the lake of fire. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Hebrews 3.14 To be initially saved, sincerely pray the following. God have mercy on me a sinner. Lord Jesus save me from my sins. They are dragging me to hell. I believe in my heart that you are the only begotten Son of God that you died on the cross for me and that God raised you from the dead. I now turn from all my sins to serve you so I won't perish. Sins of thought, word, and deed, and omission, and follow, obey you unashamedly in this wicked age. You are the only way to the Father, and I now trust you alone for my soul's salvation. Mary, church membership, bat baptism, etc., cannot save me, according to your word. And scripture references Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, 1 Timothy 2, 5, Acts 10, 43 through 48. Now, classic Arminianism, or not Arminian, Arianism, classic Arianism is that you can be saved and lose it. And uh, so you have to understand that that's uh, a lot of people out there that believe that. You can, say, you can be saved and lose it. Now, there's one thing missing from all this, and that is there's not one word about the new birth. Did you hear that, or did you notice it? Did you notice it's missing? And it's a strange thing to say that uh, you won't be hurt by the lake of fire. See, this is, gets into ambiguity, uncertain terms. And this, I now turn from all my sins to serve you so I won't perish. All right? I turn from my sins to serve you so I won't perish. What follows is a list of those sins. If you commit these sins, you can perish and wind up in the pit once again. I now turn from all my sins to serve you so I won't perish. Sins of thought, word, and deed, and omission. And follow, obey, follow, obey, forward slash, you unashamedly in this wicked age. Now you have a lot of truth in here, but it's mixed with error. And that's the worst kind. You get partial truth, but you get a lot of error. Now, this was left with a lot of people in the church, I think, was given to them. And what happens is these people came into the church here, and they sowed this doctrine to the people. They sowed it because all you have to do is open this up and read right here what they have to say. Yes, sir.
got rid of the Trinity. Sure. I mean, if they're going to get rid of the Trinity there, they're going to get rid of the Trinity, period. Yeah. And that, of course, is another heresy. That's a blatant heresy. Well, let me say this as the pastor. I don't appreciate this. I do not appreciate somebody coming into the church and, uh, and, and sowing something like this in the hands of the people. It's no good. You're welcome. I've told you a thousand times. You're welcome to do your research, read the books, do whatever you want to do. Nobody's, nobody's hiding the Bible from you. That's what the Catholics did for generations. And their, and their, and their uh, uh, mass was in Latin. Most of the people didn't understand Latin. So they kept them ignorant, and they kept them under the power of the priest, and that kind of thing. It still goes on, for that matter, uh, around the world. But I have encourage you to do your own research, to study uh, nobody's up here beating you over the head to tell you that you must believe this and that, so forth and so on. But this is unethical. This is unethical. As unethical it, it's, for example, if I went into a Pentecostal church, and I have some dear friends that are Pentecostals, they're good people. They know I don't hold with them on tongues. They know I don't do that. But if I went into their church and tried to go behind their back and, and sow discord with the people, that'd be wrong, folks. That'd be wrong. I have no business doing that. Now, let's go to the Bible tonight. Turn to the book of Romans, chapter number 4. Romans 4 and verse 3. Let's just let the Bible speak for itself. Romans 4 and verse number 3. I get a little more of this stuff on my hands. I have a hard time uh, anymore uh, just simply moving one page from another. All right, let's see what we can do here now. All right, here we are. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Father, bless the book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. So how was the Old Testament saint saved? How was he saved? Well, I want you to look at verse number 11. Same chapter, Romans 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Therefore, the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Now here's the point. Circumcision is connected with the law. God gave circumcision as a sign of, of the law, receiving the law. And Abraham, in 1900 B.C., was justified by faith through grace long before the law was ever given. And so, therefore, the apostle makes it very clear that by the keeping of the law that you can't be saved and you can't be justified, and, you, and that's not biblical faith. You can respect the law, and you can do your dead level best to keep as much of the law as you can. And the Bible teaches that uh, if you fail to keep the law, that, uh, that it could cause you to die. But the bottom line is that your salvation is not in keeping the law. Your salvation is in trusting the Lord. Amen. How do they do it? Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 10 and verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 12. This is the second giving of the law, Deuteronomos. Namos is the law, so Deuteronomy is the second giving of it. Deuteronomy chapter number 10 and verse 12. Now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to, commit, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God the earth also, and all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. He chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. 
Now, what did he tell them? He said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. And you're living under the law, so therefore you must obey the law. You must carry this burden, but it hasn't to do with your salvation. Look over here in the book of Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter number 6. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Micah chapter number 6 and verse number 8. He hath showed the old man... What is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. See that? This is what he requires of you. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. This is what Solomon had to say if he wrote that. And uh, we're not too sure of that. Ecclesiastes. Chapter number 12 and verse 13. Here's what he says. Now this is all Old Testament reading. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now do you see this? Fear God. Keep his commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and all thy soul. He gave them his commandments in the book of Hebrews, in the book of uh, Exodus. There's also 613 more commandments that make up what's uh, part of the Talmud. In plain words, there's not a Jew walking this earth probably that knows every one of those commandments. Imagine what kind of mess you'd be in. Think about that. But to trust the Lord. The Bible said Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I want you to come to the book of Matthew, chapter number 10, and verse 22. Matthew 10, 22. Now, we're still dealing with Jews. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, if you ever deal with a Arminian, he will quote that scripture to you, he'll take you to that scripture, and he'll tell you that if you don't endure to the end, that you're not going to be saved. You have to look at the context of what's going on here in Matthew chapter number 10. Go on to Matthew 24 and verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You see that? Now, this is in the tribulation. This is in the time of Jacob's trouble. This is that seven years of tribulation period that's coming on this earth. And the Jews are de being dealt with more than anybody. Because he's preparing the Jew for the coming of the Lord, for their Messiah. And he is absolutely dealing with them heart to heart, face to face, soul to soul. And he tells them in verse 14, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them be which be in Judea flee into the mountains. You see that? This is Jewish. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time dealing with it. I'm going to tell you something tonight. There's a definite difference in the early New Testament church in the time period there when Jesus Christ, our Lord, was either going to be accepted by the Jews or rejected by the Jews. And that period has passed. I want you to notice something. Christ was among them when he was here 2,000 years ago. If you'll remember when I was teaching and preaching this past Sunday, I was talking about parables. If you'll remember, in the book of Matthew, the scripture says that they gathered themselves together and sought a way to destroy him. They had already officially rejected the Son of God. And it was right after that that he went into parables. And he quotes Isaiah chapter number 6. And the Jewish people are blinded. 
according to, he quotes it about five or six times in the New Testament where they're blinded. And then when you get to Romans chapter number 11, it's as clear as it can be. They're blinded. They're blinded that God may have mercy upon these people. So now what are we getting into? I want you to think about it tonight. I want you to look to the book of Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse number 14. Hebrews 3.14, you absolutely have to find the context of what you're dealing with. Now look at Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse 14. Who's it written to? Hebrews. Look at verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ if, see the big if? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now I'm going to show you a couple of things here in just a minute. Go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number, uh, let's see, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 4. Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, Hebrews chapter number 3 is found in the same book, in the same context as chapter number 6 and verse number 4. I've never heard a preacher preach a message from chapter number 6 and verse number 4, have you? If you preach this message from chapter 6 and verse number 4, it says plainly, it's impossible to get you right with God. But it's not talking about being right with God. It's talking about an official act that takes place, something consciously chosen to do. Go on with chapter number 10, Hebrews 10, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 26. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now let's park there just a moment. How many in this house tonight sinned willfully after you got saved? Everybody did. Okay? Everybody did. So who's he talking to? Well, he's talking about the sin. What kind of sin is he dealing with? He's not talking about the sins that are natural to men, the things that you do. He's talking about something that has to do with who you accept or reject. That's the issue here in Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at chapter number 12 and verse 5. Hebrews 12, 5. Now note carefully where you're reading. Hebrews 12, 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Do you remember when you read this, I read it for you, that the new birth was never mentioned one time? Not one time. You see, the new birth is hard to undo. But it's not mentioned one time. Something else that's not mentioned in the book of Hebrews until you get to chapter number 12 is the sonship of the believer where you're called children of God. It's not found. You can do a Google, you can do a, thing, a, a search on it when you get home and a concordance search, whatever you have, your Bible programs, or just take Strong's concordance. And you will not find the words. Now, son of God is mentioned here, yes, but not the believer. Nowhere is it mentioned that the believer is a son of God or a child of God until you get to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Why is that? Because the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is completely changing the whole face of the situation. And it is no longer a Jewish thing up until that chapter. Now the Gentiles are brought into it. Now it has to do with Gentiles. And having to do with Gentiles... Gentiles that are born again. Now, I've told you before that the last gospel that was ever written 
was the Gospel of John, 90, 95 A.D., somewhere in there. We don't know exactly when. The last Gospel that was written was the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the only Gospel that mentions the new birth. These are things you ought to write down. You ought to write them down, and, and you, ought to, you ought to get the references to it. It's the only gospel that mentions the new birth. Now, Peter talks about the new birth, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible word of God, liveth and abideth forever. But here we have, here we have, the last gospel long after the Hebrew kingdom, the kingdom of heaven has been rejected, the Messiah has been rejected, and now we're on the other side of Hebrews chapter number 11, and we're facing the church age we're going into the church age. And so what he does is gives you a gospel. He gives you a gospel for that church age. And it's the gospel of John. Oh, carefully. We're not doing away with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. No, sir. That's the word of God, just like John is. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke has, is, is God's word. It's written for instruction for, and, and for righteousness, the word of God. It is God's living word. And you're not going to change that. But... You have to understand the context of what Matthew, Mark, and Luke is talking about. For when you get into the doctrine of the new birth, it doesn't make any difference what I do. I cannot change the fact that my mother and my father are my mother and my father. Nothing's going to change that. Nothing. It cannot. It's impossible. You can write up all the legal documents you want to and judges make all the proclamations they please. It's in my DNA. That's the same thing about the new birth. Look what he says in John 10. The, tenth gospel, the gospel of John is the most powerful book in the New Testament that deals with eternal security. John chapter number 10. John 10 and verse number 28. Give me just a moment to find it. And now you'll begin to understand how it goes together. John 10... 28, 28 and 29. Now look at this. John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That word pluck, that word pluck is the Greek word that literally means to take hold of and jerk out by force. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The same word translated force there is the word here, pluck. In other words, no power, there is no power that can cross over that ceiling in the hand of God and take you from his hand. Now look at verse 29. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Now, that either means that you have eternal life or you don't. But if you have eternal life, it's eternal life. It's not temporary life. And the Gospel of John is talking about eternal things. And it's talking about the new birth. And when you're born into the family of God, you're born as a son of God, and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, nothing's going to change that. Nothing. You see, on the 11th chapter... The 11th chapter of Hebrews, you've got that hall of faith. When the 12th chapter of Hebrews shows up, then he starts talking about sons and children. And notice what the context of Hebrews 12 is. Chastisement. Chastisement. If you belong to the Lord, he'll chasten you. You see? How in the world would that fit there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins? It has... The thing with no more sacrifice for sins has to do with rejecting the sacrifice for sins. Who's the sacrifice for sins? Christ. That's the sacrifice. And so when you come to the New Testament, when you come on the other side of Hebrews 11, you're talking about sons that are being chastened. And now you get into John chapter number 10 and says that you cannot be plucked out of your father's hand. I had a woman tell me this one time. I hadn't been saved long. She said, yeah, but you can pluck yourself out. I said, all right. <laughs> See what you do? It's like the man who says you've got to be baptized to be saved. And I said to him, well, what about the thief on the cross? How do you know he didn't drag him down, take him out somewhere and baptize him and put him back up there? <laughs> anything. You're going to hear anything. John 17, verse number 3. 
John chapter 17, verse 3. Now we're going to put two and two together right here in a second. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. All right, which one is life eternal? Knowing him or the one that you know? It's both. To rightfully know God is the eternal life, but Christ himself is eternal life. To receive the Son is to receive eternal life. Eternal life, not temporal life. But where do you find this? You find this in the same gospel that mentions the new birth. And have you noticed how that these folks left the new birth off? You know why? It would have complicated things for them. The new birth. The new birth. Born again. Is it important, preacher? It's all important. It's absolutely important. Look at John chapter number 6 and verse number 27 now. John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. I'm going to show you some of the ways that sealed is used, because sealing is a very important thing as it relates to your salvation. Sealing is what God does. So you can't seal yourself. God does the sealing. In Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 66, look at this. Matthew 27, 66. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 66. Matthew 27, 66. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. That's an awful lot to do for a dead body. There's more there than a dead body. That's the living word of the living God. But you see here how that the seal means that they secure it. It's secured. It can't be moved. It can't be claimed. It can't, be, it can't lose anything. It's sealed. Now, who broke that seal, by the way? Who? Angels. Exactly. Look at Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 3. Revelation 20, verse 3. And cast him, the devil, verse 2, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should not deceive the nations anymore, no more. See this? This is a seal of security. You're locked in, and you can't leave. Now, you, you couldn't lock the devil up. There's nothing physical that you could ever use to lock Satan up. This is spiritual power. This is authority above Satan's. He that letteth will let till be taken out of the way. Satan right now knows that he can only do so much and only get away with so much because there's a power greater than his that's holding him back. All right, now that's that one, that's that aspect of sealing. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 32 and verse number 34. Deuteronomy 32 th verse 34. Thirty-two, thirty-four. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 34. And here it is. Deuteronomy 32, 34. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? A sealing that conceals, a sealing that hides. The Bible says my life is hid with Christ in God. Satan does not know the nature of the new birth. He can't know it. There's no way he can. 
He can no more know the nature of the new birth than he can fully understand the nature of Almighty God. Folks, there's only one, just one, just one, that understands the nature of the Father, and that's the Son. That's the only one. Angels and cherubim, seraphim, the rest of them, they do not. But you see, this is concealed. The concealed, sealed and concealed. Daniel chapter number 9, verse 24 says this. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision or prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right? That was, that was hundreds of years before Christ. It was sealed until the time that it would be revealed. And I've always said, there are many things in the New Testament that only the tribulation saints will understand. They just don't make a lot of sense to us now. And I know good men have tried to set all this out, but I'll tell you the truth. There are just things in there that you just can't figure out. But you, these tribulation saints will because God will little open it up to them. I'm glad I won't be one of them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. It says in Job 14, verse 17, My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up mine iniquity. Glad for that, aren't you? That's what Job said. He said that 1,900 years before Christ. All right, now there's another seal. It's a seal to mark a person, a mark them, and it goes into their forehead. In Revelation chapter number 7 and verse number 3, it says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now here's what we got. We've got the servants of God with the seal of God in their forehead, and we've got the servants of Satan with 666 stamped across their forehead or in the palm of their, or in their hand, and they're, and, 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 and they're associated with his name. He's got a name, he's got a number, and he's got a mark. So we're going to have a conflict. There's going to be a conflict that kills on the tribulation period between those who are sealed with the mark of God and those who are sealed with uh, the mark of Satan. So it is a seal to mark a person. And then you have a seal. Look at the book of John, or Esther, rather, chapter 8 and verse 8. Esther chapter 8 and verse number 8. We read, Write ye also for the Jews as it lacketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no, may no man reverse. Now, archaeologists find what's called a bula. A bula is normally something about this big around, or a couple inches in, in, in diameter. And it was a soft, malleable substance and it was pushed up against a paper or something like that. It was pushed against it, and then the king would take his ring and he'd stick it in that. That gave it its authority, its identity, and it would not be broken. You'd break it at the peril of your own life. It was sealed, okay? And this is the kind of seal where he seals us, that we are sealed until the day of redemption. See, nothing can break that seal. And that's God's seal, not my seal. God's the one who seals me in, not me. And so that seal is imprinted in that. Archaeologists have found them. I've seen photographs of them in, in uh, archaeological magazines and so forth of the Bula. And I, it's quite a remarkable thing to see where they have impressed their ring into that. That is authority. That's the authority of a king. And... Uh, and you don't break it. You don't violate that because you are violating the authority of the king. So in John chapter number 3 and verse number 33, it says this. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. What does that mean? That means that the fact that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God is the testimony to the faithfulness of God to do what he said he was going to do. 
<coughs> How do you know that he seals you, preacher? Because you can't see it. Think about it. When the children of Israel were in Egypt, Egypt and they had the blood over the doorpost and lintel, they were inside, and the only trust, the only hope they had was that the death angel would see the blood. And he told them, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He didn't say, when I look inside and see if it's an Egyptian or an Israeli. No. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So therefore, it became the Passover feast. And it was a wonderful thing. And the Lord Jesus used it to institute the Lord's Supper. But this blood was a seal. It was an attestation to God's faithfulness to drive away any of the enemy who would try to devour you. And he has sealed you with the same type sealing, which is the Holy Ghost. Now think about it. Is there any power that can violate the authority of the Holy Spirit? No. No. And I said it, it's kind of like a joke. I've said it before. Have you ever tried to cast the Holy Ghost out of somebody? <laughs> By what authority? Think about it. By what power would you cast the Holy Spirit out? Now, if you're dealing with an evil spirit, masquerading as the Holy Spirit, it can come out. It is a, it is a, it is a, it is, it is a false, evil, pseudo spirit that is not the spirit of the living God. So, if you are sealed by the Holy Ghost. Till the day of redemption. That seal is an attest. When God gave you the Holy Spirit, he's saying this is the earnest of your inheritance. This is proof positive that what I started with you, I'm going to finish. And I can't tell you, folks, if you have the Holy Spirit. But I know what happened to me in 1973. Somebody moved into me that wasn't in there before. And he's never left me. And I go back to that many times, and I think about it. When you get in times where you... You know, you get down and you get depressed and, and all kinds of things can happen to us. Lord knows that. But the bottom line is there is somebody in you that was not in there before. And there's two of you now and not just the one. And that two of you, that one that is born again, is sealed. That's God's promise to you. That's the earnest of the inheritance. Sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. And what's the day of redemption? Well, he's already redeemed you. You've been redeemed. The moment you leave out of here, you don't have to be re-redeemed. The moment you leave out of this world, you're going to be present with the Lord. So what's he coming to redeem? The body. The moment of redemption. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's sown in dishonor, it's raised in honor. A different body, a redeemed redemption under the Lord. The seal. Now, I shouldn't have to ask if you have the Holy Ghost. Truth of the matter is, you're a lot better off if the Holy Ghost has got you. <laughs> so how do I know to have the Holy Spirit? You have hunger for God. You pray. You read his word. Now, that, you know, the Bible is, is not written in a, some say it's written in a seventh grade level. Well, maybe the wording, and I really, I don't think so either on that. The Bible's written at a pretty high level. Truth of the matter is, it's spiritually discerned. All right. Have you ever received anything from the Bible? You ever read it and God spoke to you from the scripture? See, that's another mark of the sealing. All right. Spoke to you. Have, has your life really changed for the better? Is there something about your life that you can go back to and say, you know, that was a day when I became a different person. I can't explain everything involved with it, but I just became a different person and a hunger. I had a hunger for spiritual things. That's the hardest thing for me to, to understand because I played pinball while they had church down at Third Creek. I played pinball. That's how much it cared. It didn't matter to me. I didn't care anything about that when I got saved. I was on the front row and I could never get enough. Amen. That's the difference between the old man and the new man. Has that happened to you tonight? See, and this fellow here, here's what he says to you. This is, writ, this, is, this, is a, this is a compendium of fear, okay? This is all about fear. That's what this is about. It's about fear. There's nothing in here that gives any of them security. These people aren't sure where they're going when they die. 
What if I had a bad thought? Read it again. I now turn from all my sins to serve you so I won't perish. Now he names the sins. Here they are. Sins of thought. Let's stop there for just a moment. Anybody here had a bad thought since you got saved? Did you lose your salvation when that happened? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. And it, he said, there's no temptation taking you, but it's just common to man. Is it a sin to be tempted? Now think about it for a moment. He will make a way of escape. Okay? A way of escape. Every man is tempted when he's led, about, led away by his own lust and enticed, James said. So he gives you a place during that where I don't know, I can't, I, you know, I'm not going to split hairs. But somewhere in there you have to understand this is my old flesh again. This is this stinking thing. And here it is. It's wanting to look at this. It's wanting to do this. Lord, help me turn from this. And you'll make a way of escape. And that's, that's the life. That's the Christian life. And if, uh, if you never are tempted, we'll bury you tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> because you're finished. That's life. I want to finish up with this. Sins of thought, word, deed, and omission. And follow, obey you unashamedly in this wicked age. Bottom line is that I thank you, Lord, for dying for me, but it's up to me to make sure that I'm going to make it. That's, that's what that says. It's up to me. Well, it's not up to you. It's up to him. And if, you know, if he knows you and you know him, he's going to chasten you. And I'm glad for that. Amen. You ever done anything and, uh, and uh, you knew the good Lord was going to come after you with the woodshed? He's come to get you. Did it get you on your knees? Did you really pour your heart out to God? Weren't you amazed when he didn't get you? When he passed over you? He said, if you'll judge yourself, you'll not be judged. Not to be condemned of the world. Amen. There's a fine line right there, and only God knows what it is. But if you'll walk with him, have fellowship with him, serve him, you're not perfect and I'm not perfect. But an attitude and from the heart is I, I love the Lord and I want to do the right thing. I thank God for that. God will go with you a long way like that. Father, bless your word. I pray, Lord, all this time up here tonight, I, I don't steer people wrong. Our salvation is not what we do. Our salvation is a person, Lord. It's a person. Christ is salvation, not whether we can keep anything or not. The Savior, he that hath the Son hath life, John told us. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. And thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift tonight that I have him. In thy name I pray, amen. Well, I appreciate you.